the headless horseman here it's september the 30th uh, 2024 first of all thanks to the sponsors uh yeah i mean markets kind of volatile today metals i i think metals were actually up during the night at least when i looked after the feuder started trading uh, up quite a bit i think uh well, like, I think gold might have been plus 1% or something. Uh, then it seems to have turned down a bit. Again, I mean, this is all noise. I mean, like I made a joke on Twitter today. It's like, oh, you know, only $1,000 for gold to go down before, you know, we'll, we'll have some real troubles in terms of solvency. Uh, for the producers, I mean, if if gold went down to uh, one thousand dollars, I mean, it would still be at sixteen hundred fifty, and I, I used to dream about that gold price. Sure, I mean, most miners wouldn't make wouldn't be making too much money, and now they're literally printing money. I mean, having a gold mine is having a gold mine, maybe for the first time in I don't know twenty years, ten years, fifteen at least. So, as always, what you focus on is up to you. I don't give a crap uh, what happens in the short term. Uh, but I do, I mean, you see it all the time. You know, let's say one day the juniors aren't performing, even when gold is up, whatever. It's like, okay, complain. It's, been, it's taken so long, fine. Okay, yes, you said your piece. You're complaining that it's so cheap and still continues to be cheap i mean that's a luxury problem to begin with it's not like let's say whatever it's like typical value investing is oh you know buy buy some buy the cheapest stocks you can find but only hold them until you know if they haven't gone up within x amount of months or something like that then you should sell them i mean that's not really value investing is it so it is kind of, I don't know, interesting that, yes, people say, oh, you know, they're cheap value investing. But as soon as they don't go up 5x within the first six months, uh, then it's, you know, too much to bear, basically. It's like, I mean, wh why why do we have such impatience? I mean, believe me, I... I Sometimes I would like to get paid off. Obviously, when we do get paid off, we're going to get paid off less and less. Because when we have actually gotten, let's say, maximum payoff, that means the sector is probably very overvalued and we uh, are in for a big drawdown. So basically, all the gains have been made and there's no, almost nothing but uh, a big correction coming up. But again, I mean, when this sector gets going, given how cheap stuff is out there, I mean, I think there's plenty of cases that's probably going to go up, I don't know, 2 to 400%, two, uh, yeah, 2 to 400% relatively easily. Basically, just based on what they already have, it's just that the market is starting to appreciate it. Then there's, of course, ex some exploration plays, for example, or not even only exploration place i mean i think some advanced explorers slash developers or or company builders i mean I, I wouldn't be too surprised if some of them also went up like 10 to 20x some of them whereas obviously exploration place can go up 10 to 20x but it's much more rare given that typically you actually have to make a significant discovery for that to happen and that's very rare uh, but I, I literally do think some some companies with you know birds in the hand that you can buy very cheaply they probably have more than two to four hundred percent potential if things go really well we go into you know gold goes to three thousand five hundred four thousand and sentiment swings we go into overvaluation at one point i mean yeah even the ones without drill risk or much drill risk probably has 10 to 20 uh, bag potential at that point. So then the question is like, okay, if you know if you know that's what the sector does when it gets going, and if we're talking about a real peak of some sort, uh, 
that comes with overvaluation. Okay, so we have an idea of just how you know massive some of the gains will be in in some of these juniors. Uh, how long should you be able to wait for that? I mean, five years really is. Uh, I mean, if if you get like a five bagger in five years, that's obviously great return compared to you know what the market averages. Uh, so, so in a sense, I mean, again, given where the valuations are, given uh, what some of these companies could do over X amount of years, it's like uh, th there's not much really that we can be too pissed off at, uh, except for, yes, you can be frustrated. It's like, okay, I really need money now. I really want the multi-bagger potential to materialize quickly. Yes, I, I get that, uh, obviously. Everybody wants, you know, as big returns as possible as soon as possible, yes. But again, when you think about it, the only thing one really has to do, pick some above average companies, preferably great companies or great cases, and, and do nothing within, you know, I don't know, it could happen tomorrow, obviously, but let, let's say when, you know, 12 to 36 months, you're probably going to be up, let's say, 300%. I mean, that's an absurdly good return. Uh, so the way I see it is like, I've already won. I mean, as you probably see on Twitter, I, I do a lot of memes, I, I do a lot of this stuff, because like... There's not much left to do except doing more due diligence. Make sure you are in the actually the cheapest ones you can find. That's the only, that's the only time and energy you should be spent on really. Just increasing as much as you can at all times the quality of your portfolio and the future expected risk adjusted returns. Not whine about it. Not do nothing. Not throw up your hands and whatever. Uh, complain about this sector being so cheap and it hasn't gone up yet. I mean, you, you can pretty much tell already who, who has a clue what's actually going on, uh, if you know what I mean. S since, according to billionaires, like this sector has never been cheaper, meaning that the future expected re returns have never been higher. The risk-adjusted future expected returns. Uh, should you be overly pissed about that? To me, this is like free money. It's like... I've already won, basically, because I saw this opportunity. It doesn't matter how long it persists. I saw this opportunity. I've taken advantage of it by buying ownership of these assets, selling at fire sale prices, even without there being a fire. It's actually not a fire at all. The house has never looked better because gold is at 2,650. Uh, so, so if one, sh uh, you know, if you're complaining about it, you're also complaining about the best best value opportunity that we might see for the rest of our lives in this space. So it doesn't really hold water that the one you should be overly disgusted or impatient. Again, given that when this sector gets going, when we go from these levels to overvaluation, and, and let's say again that gold is at 3,000 or 3,500 when the overvaluation hits, it might be 4,000. Can you imagine some of the moves in these juniors? I mean, the more I see people giving up hope that they will have, we will even even have a bull. I mean, I get more and more sure that it's like the bull might be bigger than any one of us can even fathom. And I also see some people it's like, oh, you know, I'm gonna sell after I break even. It's like, oh, great. Like a gen, uh, let's say a generational undervaluation, and 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 you plan to get off at the first stop. Let's say let's say you're down fifty percent something, since two thousand twenty, yeah, two thousand twenty. It's like oh, I'm gonna get up, uh, up uh, uh, I'm gonna get off after the average high quality junior goes up a hundred percent. I mean, come on. That's one way to waste a big opportunity. Because what what are you gonna do with it? Okay. Obviously, they're going to go and buy another sector that's already hot and do the same thing that they did in the junior space. And I, I kept saying this, like, it's pretty natural, I think, to be starting, uh, when you start off, you buy high. You buy a hot sector that you learned about or people, everyone says you should invest in. Like when juniors were 
or had been ramping for eight months straight or something and they were up 300 percent from the 2020 crash lows uh just because you start off that way because again i think a lot of people do that that doesn't mean it's like oh i'm gonna re i need to repeat that cycle i'm gonna buy high sell out low or miss most of the move then i'm gonna find another sector i mean you, then you have learned nothing obviously why would you if you're even able to buy low and then you're gonna sell low because quote this sector doesn't work so okay if if a cheap sector the starting to make a move if if that's not for you because you're getting off at the first stop i mean again what sector are you after obviously it has nothing to do with price relative to value because otherwise you'll probably be sticking around so if you know what i'm saying that you you can kind of tell who uh, uh, who have a, a even the faintest shot of actually ever breaking the cycle and actually coming up with a you know deploying a, a strategy that makes sense and is repeatable and should work uh, forever because most again have no such strategy they buy on a whim they sell on a whim have no idea what they own have no no i mean i don't really use a lot of price targets i just if something is cheap it's like well i don't know exactly what's going to happen but uh, a from sentiment alone b uh let's say out of uh many different scenarios that could happen it's like i say see 70 percent of them turning this investment to you know a good return or uh, to a great return it's like I, I don't i don't want precision i want no brainers typically where it's like okay this is dirt cheap and then i imagine myself in the future going back to this story uh, to whatever story after it's gone up to 300 percent and okay how would i think about the story at this price and goals at 2600 after it's gone up i would probably go back and say wow i should have bought even more but of course nobody does that when the actual opportunity presents itself and the old classic is okay if it's cheap i mean this sector has been cheap for the last two years or something and some translate that into okay then buying cheap doesn't work because you're you're it's taken two years and you're not in the money yet. Of course, that's not how it works. And again, depending on the move that you're expected from uh, a certain degree of cheapness, the, the, cheaper, the cheaper a sector is, the more you expect it to go up in the future when the pendulum swings. Uh, so, I mean, selling late just becomes worse and worse. It's like, okay, if it was cheap two years ago, it's even cheaper now. And you sell for what, what reason? Because it has, they haven't moved up yet. And then they start going up for real in like two and a half years. But you sold out because it's taken too long. And then, then you're less scratching your head. It's like, oh, why can't I make money? Well, it's pr a pretty clear why you can't make money. Because you put a time limit on the market staying rational. I mean, the market is absolutely a joke right now. It's absolutely, It's kind of boring, actually. Because it's so hard to make a mistake. And I'm not, by making a mistake, I mean actually we're paying for something. I don't mean if, oh, if you bought a cheap explorer and the project didn't pan up, pan out, they didn't make a discovery, or, you know, just because something is cheap doesn't mean you're going to make money on it. But now the risk reward is just re absolutely ridiculous across the board. Again, to the point where it's like you can have pretty de risked advanced juniors. And without even any additional drilling success, uh, fair value might be two, three hundred percent higher, even more than that in some cases. If you combine that with some growth potential and a good management team with skin in the game, it's like if you have twenty of those stories, like you're not you're not gonna lose. That that is why this sector is boring right now. Because there's no real thrill. This is like a walkover. I don't know how many, it's like any time I get pitched a decent store, it looks like an obvious buy. So I could have a very diversified portfolio and I think that would do great. Uh, that's not the case in a high sentiment environment because then the opportunities are few and far between. And most, uh, I mean, there's a real risk of your paying, meaning that price should go down and stay down. Uh, okay. Uh,
anyway, it's like I've been away f most of last week. Uh, well, kind of away. Uh, I was at the Nordic Funds and Mines here in Stockholm. Uh, I really liked the event. I mean, it was very convenient for me because I live in Stockholm. Uh, I met, I don't know, 20 companies maybe. And I'll talk more about uh, some or all of the companies I met with in another video. I thought I would make more of a uh, look at some news items first. Uh, but yeah, I mean, met some people I've never met before, you know, talked to online, uh, etc. Met some uh, great Swedish investors, which I've never met before either. Um, uh, so for me, it was very, very productive. Met a lot of, met a lot of interesting people. Uh, I was also at, uh, this was actually the day before the conference started. I went up with Taj, the CEO of uh, First Nordic, went up to the Barsley project. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to get there. It's like one hour flight uh, from Stockholm. And I think there's one flight up there and one flight back to Stockholm every day. It possibly could be even more often, but it's like, as far as I understand, you could literally... There's there's a plane leaving for for uh, Luxella, the Luxella airport, which is not far from Barcelona, uh, every single day. Uh, I mean, you could almost basically work in uh, or live in Stockholm and commute to the Barcelona project. And you know, when it becomes a mine, hopefully sometime in the future, I met the Agnico Eagle team up there, including Kora Haglund. Um, or maybe it's Kora Haglund. No, I think it's Haglund. Who is, uh, I think it's like the regional exploration manager for Agnico Eagle. Or, or regional exploration manager for Europe for Agnico Eagle. Uh, I, from what I hear, he's an absolutely brilliant geologist. It's not like I can sit and fact check him. But he has some very interesting stuff um, to say. I mean, they... they He's had time to think. I mean, I, I don't. I think he might have been involved all the way from the start, like 2015, uh, with the Barsley project, for example. He also speaks Swedish. He's actually a Finn, but he speaks Swedish and obviously English. Uh, fun to meet him. Again, smart guy. Really, really nice guy. Really, really nice guy. Uh, and I was able to get some Agnico Eagle merch, which I'm very happy uh, about because, like. Let's face it, Agnico is like the the rock star of the gold space, and I mean, for obvious obvious reasons, uh, a junior, a gold junior, literally, I don't think can get a, a better vote of confidence than Agnico Eagle because they are literally the best at what they do. I was, I would say. Uh, let's look at some news. Goliath upsizes non-broker price placement from 15 million 725,000 to 16,120,000. Uh, so people just keep throwing money at Goliath. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so they'll have a pretty nice drill budget. Uh, should cover all the drilling for this year. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the plan was up to 36,000 meters and I've talked about this before uh, on K report for example that uh, I mean when this closes there's gonna be months wor worth of exploration drilling or drill results including like uh, regional targets let's say new targets to be tested and obviously a shore bit zone bonanza zone you know uh, mother load zone and whatever all the names they have for them so the way i view this again i mean i was gonna say a, a lot of it i think the more you try to learn about the market and stuff that a lot of it comes down to uh, gut feeling i mean you you kind of have a sense maybe what you think a store might do or what the risk reward is the, if if i just you know theoretically here it's like okay if Knowing that when this closes, there's going to be, let's say, 36,000 meters worth of assays coming. And we know a lot of the holes have VG. 
uh, at least some of the uh, uh, well the visuals we've heard about let's say I don't expect any holes to come out before this private placement closes by the way uh, but then there, again there, it's gonna be an unbroken that's what I expect at least an unbroken stream of drill results possibly some who have very you know high grades or bonanza grades and there might even be some discoveries and all of that um, and there's not going to be a private placement in sight they probably have enough money to start drilling next year actually that those are the setups i really really like especially if you're kind of a let's say uh, drill speculator in a sense because again in a vacuum or or in this case at least in particular what are the i mean they're gonna be like diluting a bit so market cap is gonna go up i don't know what, what the market cap will be like i don't know 180 million 170 million maybe but just think about this okay what are the risks to the upside or the downside that I mean, they don't have a resource, but it already looks like they have a few to several million ounces. Not that uh, that would get into a resource necessarily, but it's like, you know, the footprints, footprint and all that. It's like, okay, inferred, inferred kind of type. We, this looks like a multi-million ounce system. Uh, so, okay, do we think that the market will have a more positive view on Shore uh, or on Goliath and the Goliath discovery or the Goliath project, Shorebit project, after 37,000 additional meters of drilling have come out? Or will they release 37,000 meters of drilling and uh, the market cap will actually be lower? My bet is that it's to the upside. I think it's very hard to kill this project, for example, because of the high high hit rate so far. Uh, that also means I think there's, they are going to hit on a lot of holes. And we know they have some discovery potential as well that could just use up the story further, basically. Uh, so, yeah, if I had a bet, which I am, um, I think Goliath is going to be higher. And again, I, I'm not looking for necessarily precision because like I, I don't know exactly what footprint they're going to prove up or what the exact resource is going to be sometime in the future or or what the sentiment is even going to be in the future in six months not even one month from now I don't know where gold is going to trade I don't know what you know dollar per ounce Goliath could get none of that I just have my gut feeling is that given what we know about the project Given how much they're drilling, given that there would be no overhang of a coming private placement, un unless, I don't know, things go really, really, really well and somebody throws even more money at them. Uh, so there's not going to be this typical thing where it's like a junior raises mon some money, aff can afford to drill a few holes. And, uh, and uh, you know, let's, let's say you drill five holes, okay? And the market knows that's all the money you have. You only can afford five holes. After those five holes are out, I mean, the market is going to know that, okay, the next, maybe the next significant news release after those five holes is going to be a uh, financing. And people hate financings. People, you know, oh, dilution is always bad, even though it's required for, for assets to even take place in the first place or drilling to take place still okay but if you don't have that overhang you, you don't have that kind of yeah like, like back end loaded negative thing because if you only can drill for five you know afford five holes if you drill those five holes unless they're like i don't know insanely good you know they have to be that kind of in this market for anybody to really get greed or care uh, it's got to also be good enough to uh, again like trump the negative sentiment of the next uh news is being a private placement unless again the the holes are so f obscenely good that you know that people will do everything to get into the story in a sense. Uh, 
yeah, if it's that exciting. But it's like even a lot of discoveries that will become major discoveries, let's say, if you can just grill five holes at a time, it's very hard to obviously go to a world class deposit in a hurry. And you will have the kind of, you know, fits and st- or yeah, fits and starts like, okay, you, you raise a bit of money, grill, grill five to ten holes, let's say nobody really cares, okay, then you know you're going to be diluting again. And then you redo the other th- uh, or do it again because nobody wants to raise too much at low prices. So you're always like waiting for the market to turn alive. I, I hope you get my point. So it's like it's quite unusual that you'll have so much drilling without another placement. I mean, it's it's not absolutely unheard of. There are some. Uh, but I'm just saying I think it's a really good setup that Goliath puts themselves in where where no assay will have that overhang of well now the next news release is going to be that they're uh, n- going to need to raise money so why buy now it's more like okay the only way i can really get into this story in, in the next maybe nine months will be to buy in the open market once this closes anyway uh also one that i haven't uh, or, or or i missed this news when it came out came out uh, 10th of september kodak Copper's first add its own drilling uh, intersects near surface high grade copper 0.76 CU equivalent over 156 meters within 0.46 CU equivalent over 357 meters. I mean, that, uh, th- these are some very meaty results, especially if you compare it to the like the average grade of the open pit porphyry mines in the area. Interestingly enough, and I didn't know this before speaking to the company i mean uh, there there are some you don't need too high high of a grade in bc open pits i think that's mostly because they're very cheap uh, power and stuff so if you have a very you know earth moving operation require and you know whatever high throughput requires a lot of energy but if you have very cheap power your costs go down and your cutoff grade goes down obviously uh, which is uh, which is obviously good and uh, BC porphyries are apparently famous for typically not being as high grade as you know in Chile and whatever so it's so it's basically uh, the expectations for porphyry deposits in BC seem to be that they are not you know the the highest grade ones uh, or or that they typically don't rival the Chilean or you know Peruvian porphyries in terms of grade and um, let's face it i mean some of those mines down there they're at like three to five thousand meter elevation way 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 from any source of water so the capex is like huge and all that so you obviously need better ore bodies to make it worth uh while uh but yeah so Hole 25007 is the best hole ever drilled at added based on grade times width, intersecting 357 meters as in yeah, 0.43% CU, 0.02 grams per ton AU, and 10.05 grams per ton AG. 0.46 CU equivalent from 89 to 446 meters. So basically, I mean, it starts at very shallow levels. Um, and uh, that's it here, the added zone. The interesting thing here is i think they mentioned that in the comments yeah added is also interpreted to be part of a larger porphyry system that extends over three kilometers and includes the mid south and 15 16 zones that is zone is still open in multiple directions and we expect results from further uh, holes from this zone the majority of this drill uh, this year's results are still outstanding and their sh- shareholders can expect ongoing news flow over the coming month so th- there's a lot more to come uh, and as they meant or as claudia turnquist mentions earlier added is the third sizable high grade zone drilled by codec at mpd to date in addition to the gate and west zones we are thrilled with our first drill results from added which successfully extended shallow mineralization from historic drilling and demonstrate that this zone is significantly larger than interpreted in the past uh, so this is basic. They they now believe that instead of having you know many individual systems or like let's say small porphyries or whatever, the the recent thinking is that this is part of one big 
system. So it's like you you have some places where it comes up to uh, you know shallow levels, for example. I mean, you can see that uh, yes, these are a drill hole historical, but most of them are very shallow, as we can see here. Uh, this was actually done by uh, this hole was actually done by Evrim, but you can see typically that I mean, look at these holes here. What's that? 50 meter holes, 50, 100 meter holes. It's very hard to drill, uh, you know, an intercept of several hundred meters of mineralization if you drill 50 to 100 meter holes. So even though, I mean, this is me talking here, even though there's, you know, at least in this part of this target, which is only one target on the overall land package, and they will increase the land package as well, they did that after this news release actually. So they expanded the project and got some uh, pretty nice targets, I think mostly in the Northwest. Anyway, I mean, this isn't really testing too well uh, all this, you know, copper in soil anomaly. I mean, one short hole there, one short hole there, one short hole there. I'm not sure what these even hit, but it's like, that's a pretty beefy anomaly there. This hasn't seen any drilling. Uh, here we had uh, one longer hole. I mean, this short hole, somewhat decent hole, but it's like short. I assume these are short as well. So you 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 never know basically. So I, I think this looks more drilled than it actually is. Again, depending on uh, the fact that okay here where the drill is at it hole. I mean, most of the other holes are just basically scratching the surface. Uh, with that said, yes, this is a hole that was uh, drilled kind of underneath and through like perpendicular, I guess, or obliquely maybe is the word, uh, to most of the other drilling. Uh, but it's still, as the uh usually suggest is the best hole that drilled it at it and it kind of i mean confirms that there's a pretty decent blob here of, of material that uh, with those grades should be uh i mean quite economic obviously you wouldn't build a mine just based on on one near surface, you know, smaller open pit, but maybe as a, you know, satellite type target or maybe a starter, uh, starter pit, some, somewhere along those lines. Um, and they did test some additional targets as well, Belkara target drilling. Uh, hole three and four were drilled to the northeast to test a 300 meter wide copper in soil and conductive geophysical anomaly that coincides with the interpreted extension of the gate zone fault. Drilling conferred copper mineralization when in this target hole MPD4 intersected a 34 meter wide zone of uh, clay sericite altered fault breccia with CU AU AG mineralization as sulfide veining or replacement features. So there's mineralization there, obviously. I mean, uh, there's the might be the outskirts of something hole 003 did not reach the targeted depth or gate zone fault due to ground conditions okay, okay so that literally didn't even reach the target depth so that's unfortunate so basically they had one okay test uh well, well not one okay test uh, out of these two holes one reached drill holes mpd 2401 and 002 were drilled to east, drilled eastward to test a separate verify AI epsilon area and a 3D chargeability and only present at depth. Both holes intersected pyro dominated sulfide mineralization with altered diorite and side host rocks without significant copper. Again, I'm not a geologist, okay? They haven't seemed to made a discovery from these four holes at the Belcara target at least. Uh, that we can kind of surmise especially or at least not a you know discovery hole in terms of assays maybe you know there's some good sniffs in terms of you know geology that okay uh it might look good whatever i mean it's it's not too far away from the gate zone either so it's like okay we know there's porphyry here it's not a stretch that who knows how the how how 
a potential extension, you know, which direction it, uh, direction it goes and all that. But yeah, so okay, no, no, I mean, the, the this hole is impressive, uh, that's for sure. Again, especially if you compare it to the average grade of the poor freeze round. Uh, but it wasn't a barn burner in the eyes of the market. I mean, I, I think given the sentiment, that's quite understandable. Uh, but this is simply one uh, story that I, I think is you know, quite cheap, given that they already have the gates on Discovery. Some pretty smart people involved. Uh, huge amount of targets in BC, it's copper and all that. Uh, but this story is still waiting for A. I mean, every copper unit is basically waiting for sentiment to improve for copper juniors uh, but also maybe you know that uh, new exciting discovery kind of so we don't know i mean uh, ongoing news flow over the coming months so if you're a copper bull and likes exploration I, I think i mean obviously there's some again there's chris taylor from great bear who's in this for example um it's part of the discovery group of companies so you might you, i mean those are not those are not stupid people uh, so they obviously have an idea they have a reason to be here uh, tech actually funded them i think that might be last year or two years ago or something i don't think they participated in the latest latest round though uh, but i mean that could be tech is like okay you know <laughs> We'll come back when you, you make... A, and I might be wrong on that. I, I don't remember seeing tech in the last last round. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, like many of these, you know, district scale lamp package plays, kind of. Uh, you, you never know when something surprising might happen. I mean, it's, it's hard to surprise to the downside, really, given that uh, they already have a... a uh, you know drilled out a discovery gate it's just okay it's they've not the market does not view them as you know having reached a critical threshold for success maybe or at least you know not take over target candidate uh, it's like you know major size discovery where it's like okay if gate is too small on a standalone basis okay can they show that hey you know yes uh, it's not only gate but we found an, uh, another gate or you know two more gates or, or something even bigger maybe again maybe this is gonna end up being a massive porphyry body but they obviously have to drill test it for in order to find that out so I mean I think this is very much worth having on the watch list and I think one of the uh, better uh, copper exploration plays if you like you know if you like copper and, and want to stay in the uh, a jurisdiction that is very hot, because obviously uh, almost every major miner seems to be interested in BC. I mean, you have you have tech that's invested in this. You have BHP with Brixton. You have Newcrest that went in there. Uh, you have Newmont, which bought Newcrest. Barrick is talking about uh, Canada, uh, at least. Uh, you know, Agnico Eagle loves... Canada uh, so yeah I mean the, the proof is going to be in the pudding I mean I, I think this is a cheap copper exploration bet and uh, you, you never know really I mean it, it, they only require one hole I mean one hole could change the entire story overnight uh, basically and you know start lighting it on fire because I think it's very much unloved now. It used to be one of the harder stories when they made the gate discovery. Uh, so as always, I think uh, it's taken so much punishment that you know it's going to take something to really turn it around. But that also means that typically those stories get uh, way undervalued because they start the pricing in, start the price in no chance of having something that's going to be a, a mine one day, for example. And I don't think the people involved here would keep doing this if they thought they had no shot of, uh, you know, make, making another discovery or like a combined discovery that would put them in the crosshairs of, uh, you know, like the shareholder tech would be interested in. Uh, anyway, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, basically. I mean, at least they're 
proving up more uh, near surface high grade copper pounds uh, which is obviously a positive in itself uh, then we have home run so this come up today home runs uh, COO Armando Farhate I don't know how to pronounce that but attended a very important meeting today with partners C CBPM and multiple government officials from the Baia state government. The secretary acknowledges the seriousness and disruption permit, permit I don't know how to know, pronounce that, through, uh, throughout the home run organization. Um, so, I mean, I, I think they have in the forum, I think Tyler, yeah, picture left to right, Luciano Gudish Torres, superintendent of investment attraction and fostering of economic development, economic development, Division of the Government of Bahia, Paulo Henrique de Almeida, Director, Economic Development Division of the Government of Bahia, Lorena Fraga, Chief of Staff, C uh, BPM, Armando Farhat, Chief Operating Officer of Home Run Resources, Angelo Almeida, Secretary of State of Bahia, Economic Development, Carlos Borrell, President of C BPM. I mean, uh, I don't think you just, you know, get those people together for no reason, if you know what I mean. Uh, but the, the home run is actually a very interesting story, uh, par partially because of the, uh, let's say, investor psychology going on. Uh, home run is still a very large position for me. Uh, I, I don't care too much about the daily swings. I mean, I personally, I can't be bothered with, I mean, there's for sure a bash crew in this channel and it's like, there's, you know, bands, yeah, bands hand, handed out left and right, basically. But but you got to remember this. Uh, short count is like 112,000. That's nothing. Uh, volume today, I was going to say nothing. Uh, not nothing, but you get my point. And it's like, okay, we can see. I mean, from a TA kind of perspective, okay, it, it kind of held up. 1.5 zone okay for what was this like down to low 1.6 okay 1.6 whatever low 148 low 15 and it's, so it basically stuck to that it's like you can you can believe that there are some traders just watching for that so, okay so what happened i mean they put out this news release home run resources provide supply chain logistical plan for High pure silica sands originating from the Belmonte Silica District is pleased to provide the company's logistical pathway from extraction to shipping of the high purity quartz HPQ silica sand from deposits in Belmonte by Brazil to the domestic and international markets. Uh, I mean, you, you can read this at your own leisure, basically, but I mean, again, I, I don't need to know every single detail. Like Brian Leaner, CEO of Homer, further stated, we are on pace and 18 months into our business development plans and I want to extend my compliments to our team for the exceptional focus on execution. Traditional discovery to mining timelines can take more than 10 years and Homer is condensing that down to 24 months. When combined with the parallel advances in our vertical integration strategy, we are well on our way to achieving scale through disruption within our energy transition building both Brazil and beyond. I mean, they have a shit ton going on, as you probably know. They have some, you know, uh, they have some partnerships with, uh, I think, isn't it like some, I mean, US agencies. What's that? I'm trying to remember the, oh, the university in US. Anyway, heavy hitters, basically. And they have like a partnership or a MOU or something with uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, they obviously has, obviously has the LOI with CMEX and yada, yada, yada. And you know the macro trends, silver, or silver, I was going to say, uh, solar panels are like exploding worldwide. And uh, the biggest thing in solar panels, both in terms of weight and value, are, is silica and silicone. So they have the most important ingredient in solar panels. And solar panels are exploding and it's ex exploding in in brazil which they happen to be in. uh so uh, as far as i can see it's like i mean nothing has changed except for maybe or or let's put it like that this everything or yeah everything is underway 
if you know what I mean. That's basically what uh, you know they're describing and and basically explaining their strategy. And I would assume again because there, there was a lot of let's say emotional build up for that ninety day window, and I think that is has gone. Uh, and and you never know. There might be. There might be like one thing away from, you know, whatever, being able to announce what they want to announce. Let, let's put it like that. And you have this m massive kind of emotional build up. And yes, in, in a sense, uh, I think the timeline put or, the, you know, somewhat of a deadline, uh, maybe uh, it ended, you know, backfiring from the company, if you know what I mean. Uh, because the thing is obviously, I mean, it's not like nobody knows that the market is super impatient. I mean, you can see what happens in, in this room uh, because there's not been, you know, barn burning, uh, uh, a barn burning news release in, in, you know, a few months. I mean, everything basically turns to shit in a sense. And since everybody really is, uh, uh, was, what, what was I going to say? So, uh, momentum trader, kind of. So you have this 1.5 support and between news in junior land, it's like the twilight zone. Because the only really thing or the value of a company really only changes with news. So in between news, let's say there's a month between one news item and another news item, then it's like all not all but it's like it's sentiment the rules in between and here you have a very uh, or quite illiquid stock uh, and you have this again obvious like okay 1.5 1 1.5 1 uh, somewhat uh, defended let's say again from a trading perspective so everybody's looking at a 1.5 okay they put out that news release obviously it wasn't you know anything negative that i could find in it except for it not being a barn burner if you know what i mean yes um, uh, so, so basically that because it wasn't a barn burner, let's say, or it's like, okay, you know, things are the, things are delayed. So created a huge volume spike because also it broke down below one five. I was like, what, what really has changed? Uh, I wouldn't say much, uh, but again, just look at activity and, and this is without any, you know, one new side, I mean, okay, well, actually, right, I mean, they, they put out this, so, but, but also no, no, like, you know, shock, shock news release, like, uh, announcing completion of drilling and all of that. Uh, so just that fact, because, like, let's face it, if, if you want to play the, if you want to influence us, story whatever it's like i mean it's kind of a, okay oh they put out news then you kind of maybe know that okay there's not gonna be a news item tomorrow let's say that is shocking to the upside uh, uh in terms of uh, logistics for example maybe maybe they think it's like two weeks off or a month off or something and they put out this news release They're like hey guys everything is on track i mean look at how quickly we have advanced things and then you see uh uh uh, then you set pitch like that. It's like I have a hard time seeing that uh, they are able to bring these guys together, and it's all, all really a joke. And it's like there's nothing really going on, whatever, because obviously they're putting their credibility at risk. Uh, so I think it's a, I mean, basically, this forum, this channel has taken a life on its own. Uh, and uh, again, it's like shorts one hundred twelve thousand. I mean, that's less than my, that's less than my position. Uh, not much in terms of liquidity. So it's like, okay, you know. It, my point is that uh, there's a lot of shenanigans that happens in in high high sentiment stocks. Let's say. I mean, did home run run too high here? There's like, okay, you know, uh, ran too high. I mean, sentiment was very high up here, obviously. It's like, my sentiment was very high as well. Uh, then maybe again, it's like, okay, things haven't played out exactly as quick as we all hope because they were just pumping out news releases 
there for a while. Everything felt like lightning fast, but it might simply be that, okay, they're in a part, especially the more important it becomes or the realer the stories. You obviously want to get things right from the get-go. So maybe, you know, that has led to a month of delay or two months of delay of announcing whatever, you know, they would be uh, or, or hope to uh, announce, let's say. But that's it. I mean, let's say you have a 90-day window pass, so people were barely holding on because of the 90-day window. It's like, okay, oh, now we passed that. You know, people get scared or and impatient. And then you have a whole truckload of bashers in here. And it's like, do you think these bashers are, what, like, oh, uh, I mean, they're not shorting or there's no... There's no shortcut with any meaningful volume here, at least. But I get it. it might be a good stock to to like uh, small time trade in a sense, or who knows? Maybe, maybe because the thing is obviously with the last placement uh, they did. I think it was kind of. I mean, more people wanted in, but they cut it off. It's like they didn't even want to take in more money. I mean, that that kind of oozed confidence. Okay, is, the, is it possible that some might have been pissed off that they didn't get a chunk in the placement and now they're like super pissed about that, especially since it, I mean, the placement was done at 50 cent and it ran to 2.68. And, and those guys, you know, got warns as well. Yeah, I can see if you miss out on that, I can see people literally get bitter and want to bash the shit out of the story. Because nobody, a few, or a lot of people hate seeing other people make money when they are not making money. A lot of people like pointing out other people's mistakes, especially if they're not doing well. But I can assure you there's no real smart money bashing in this channel. Actual smart money, actual, let's say, wealthy, really successful investors, they would not spend time bashing a, a junior silica play, for example. I have, I mean... Home run is a big position for me. I don't even have time to be in this room and just, you know, post every day, if you know what I mean. Because as far as I under or as far as I know, the case is intact. The case is that either this will work and some of the, let's say some of the verticals pay off. I can see, you know, billion dollar plus payday. Or it won't work, nothing will work, they won't be able to make any solar glass in, in, in our lifetimes, I was going to say. Not be able to sell any silica product at any sort of profit. And, and basically, yes, they will not be able to do anything that warrants a 61 million market cap in the next 10 years. Compare that to the, to the upside. Let's say everything is actually on track. Maybe there are some delays with signing some deals or sorting out some logistical thing. Maybe we are, I don't know, a week, a month away from like some very juicy news release about the femtosecond laser or, or uh, MOU or LOI or yada yada. I mean, they have a shit ton of irons in the fire. Uh and it's like, I, I don't, again, I don't really care. On, on paper, I made a lot of money here. And on paper, from the top, I've lost a lot of money here. But that doesn't, again, concern me that much. It's like, I'm not, act, I'm not after perfection. Idiots are after perfection. It's like, if this works, I'm going to make a shit ton of money. If it doesn't work, I'm going to lose money. That's it. That's the symmetrical risk reward. And it's just gotten cheaper and cheaper, meaning, okay, now, if this actually works out, people obviously are going to make more money from 61.5 million market cap than from 130 million or whatever it was up here. Uh, if, if it doesn't work out, well, the downside, theoretical downside is always 100%. So the question is, I mean, how, let's say, put like, how fucked are, you know, home run if, if they get all of these guys to... Uh, do a fo photo session. I mean, th does home run show up? It's like, hey, we got nothing going, by the way. Let's take a picture, guys. No, I, I mean, 
obviously I think they are looking at home runs like okay I mean maybe who knows maybe they're more interested in the verticals that's like okay guys so we kind of understand what you got cooking here so if you are able to make you know ultra pure silica from using laser technology that's you know gonna be a disruption in in you know in the silica in in, in the silica space so th that's my thing it's like everybody's biased believe me especially i mean <clears throat> especially the ones who, who say they are not biased i mean that's already a red flag kind of Believe me, I am biased. I'm biased in all I'm, uh, with all I'm saying here. Everybody does... Any single post somebody, somebody makes is for a reason. There are no Mother Teresas in here just trying to basically spend all their time helping other people in one specific stock, if you know what I mean. I obviously want home run to go up. Well, let's put it like this. If I was smart enough and could figure out that home run is actually more advanced or even better or a much better buy than a 2.6 uh, or whatever it reached. And I think, okay, I have a pretty clear picture that this is going to go to like $6 within the next 12 months or something. Obviously, if I knew that or was uh, that smart or maybe... I was going to say bold, uh, I would make more money in case I, you know, uh, uh, double down here, if you know what I mean. I mean, that's actually tempting to me. My problem is that I, you know, I had a big position 50 cent. I have a, had a huge position at 2.68. I still have a very large position here. So it's not like I can change anything meaningful, if you know what I mean. Yes, I might be able to add like 5% to my position. Uh, given the lack of funds I have right now. Um, but yeah, so I mean, in, in the end, uh, the, uh, the downside is always 100%. Question is, what is the upside? How many potential upside surpri surprises could there be? And I, I think Home Run has a bunch of upside, potential upside surprises. And I think the macro environment they are in has huge tailwinds. And, and I don't give a crap really what some ano anonymous bashers post in the forum. Because this you can basically take to the bank. They are not good investors. But you, you see bashers uh, uh, look smart or at least for a while. And some, sometimes they actually uh, prove to you know, be right or look right. For example, but there's not, there there are there are no highly successful investors that will spend their time bashing or really pumping stocks every day. You know, uh, small cap juniors, illiquid juniors. That that you can take to the bank. Okay, remember that. I mean, I find myself spending less and less time on. CEO.ca because like I'm quite comfortable with my picks. I'm waiting for some news to happen, let's say. I don't take real advice from somebody I have no idea who it is who spends their all day just pumping or bashing micro cap companies. I mean, th by that time, you, you know well enough that they're not good investors because if they were really good investors, they wouldn't really be do doing that. So, I mean, I, I think, however this is going to play out, it's like, rem remember, remember this experience, let's say. Remember what went on in home runs. Like, ho hopefully, knock on wood here, ho hopefully home run will be at like five bucks in 12 months or something. And then you can look back, it's like, oh my God, it's like, I can't believe uh, Everybody thought the sky was falling when nothing of the sort really had been, you know, announced, and we were still waiting for a bunch of different stuff to happen. Uh, but still, re remember that, like, soak it in, because th this is like everyday stuff in in the jun uh, junior sector. And again, it's like the m one I would say, like a rule of thumb: the more someone says they are just, you know, uh, 
unbiased and whatever, that means they're more biased. I mean, you, you sometimes even see that in the actual in the actual names. And believe me, most people are absolutely crap at investing. Uh, that's just that's just how it is. I mean, for the general stock market, one in twenty, so five percent, outperform an index if they're actively investing their own money. If we are talking uh, the junior space, given that the junior space typically sucks eighty percent of the time, does well twenty percent of the time, probably less than five percent. So vast, vast majority of all comments you will read on forums and on Twitter is coming from people that uh, have not been able to outperform an index over the long term. Basically, they are not good investors. And, and, and people say a lot of stuff that's not necessarily to mislead or anything. It's just that, and it makes sense to them, if you know what I mean. It's not like everyone intentionally tries to... Uh, lead people astray it's, it's just that for some reason their, their logic doesn't really work in the sector i mean i know really nice guy on really nice guys on twitter and in real life but it's like they're, they're absolutely hopeless investors really good people don't mean to do anyone any harm but they they cannot control their emotions basically that and again uh in between news releases uh, that is when you can really, let's say, mess mess uh, with people and sentiment and all that. And again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see it. It's like, okay, uh, kind of drifting towards 1.5, 1.5. As soon as that broke, even though it was like, uh, it's, uh, this wasn't even a you know, negative news release. Uh, but when it broke there, people got selling. When, again, when it broke. So maybe a lot of people have stop losses and what have you, what have you. And then obviously there's going to be a shit ton of people who are like, oh, you should have listened to me. I, I, I uh, foresaw this, that it would hit yada yada and yuri yuri babba babba. But it's the same, well, almost the same thing. It's like, I mean, let's say I, I say, let's say, uh, let's say I take a liquid stock or a real micro cap. And I'm like, oh, this stock is going to go up 50% or whatever. For no other reason, like just a technical number, let's say. And then I pumped the shit out of the stock. Promised, you know, 10 baggers all around, like guaranteed 10 baggers, 20 baggers. And people buy it up. Okay, so it goes up 50%. And I look smart, like, you know, how, how smart was, was that? Or it's like, oh, you know, a crappy sentiment environment, yada, yada. Uh, so again, I, I don't know, it's like the short count isn't that high, so I don't even know. I mean, there's, there's, uh, I, I don't know what people are doing, really. Uh, well, this was uh, very much of a tangent, uh, but that's it. It's like, I mean, it's just, there, there's so, <laughs> May, who knows, maybe that's a straight, but it, it's exhausting because th there's so many posts. And you have obviously the people with a lot of money invested in this story. They don't want to see people, let's say, I'm going to say mislead other people or, or you know, bash or spread food or whatever you call it, fear, uh, uncertainty and doubt. Because they have a lot of st at stake, which is probably contrary to the bashers. So they're going to be defending it. And, you know, the more obnoxious, let's say, the bashers get... Uh, the ones with a lot of skin in the game um, uh, reply in kind and then there's like oh you, you don't need to take it so seriously or for example or personal but I mean to them they are personal but if you have no stake in this it's like why are you here you know what I mean it doesn't really hold water um, so yeah I, I mean I, I don't worry too much about it it's like it, it, the, the, the whole idea was that either again Give home run, let's say, you know, 12 to 36 months. Uh, that should be enough to see some of these verticals and, and a lot of other stuff. So for all intents and purposes, for all I know, everything is basically on track. And all the upside potential is still left there. And it's, um, again, the only thing we know is the current market cap. 
I mean, it's obviously not pricing in that any uh, real success will come from the laser, the LOI, MOUs, partnerships, or that they will, you know, really be able to sell any silica at any decent price for any profit. Because you don't need a big business really to support 61 million market cap. It's like, I mean, if they, if they take in 6 million in EBITDA in the next two years or something, that's now it's trading at 10x EBITDA. So, I mean, uh, yeah, again, uh, no, <laughs> there's only risk reward. There's no absolutes. But I think this actually is a good example and a learning experience. And it also kind of forces you in a way to suffer the volatility because I know how it is now. It's like, okay, oh, I wish I'd sold up here. It's like, hey, I was very much, uh, uh, I get, again, I drink my own Kool-Aid. I get more bullish in a sense uh, when, when the stock price kind of confirms it. You know what I mean? And they were just pumping it news releases and now in hindsight it's like oh sh should have sold up there and and then it turns into oh you know the the regret let's say and it's like okay if if it goes down below whatever i'm gonna sell because i can't take it going down you know 10 percent more or something but that's the interesting thing it's like schrodinger's cat we have no idea maybe <laughs> things are better than ever behind the scenes in in home run and uh, yeah it's just uh, as as is typical it necessarily doesn't show up in the short term we have again we have no idea we have no idea exactly what they're uh, working on but this is suggesting that um i i don't i i think it, the form is way more dramatic than than what's actually happening uh, yeah uh oh yeah first nordic First Nordic strengthens board with addition of Mr. Jeffrey Couch. Uh, First Nordic is pleased to announce the appointment of Mr. Jeffrey Couch's board of directors. Okay, who's Jeffrey Couch? Mr. Couch is a seasoned capital and markets executive with extensive experience in the natural resource sector, having advised and raised capital for clients globally with particular focus on emerging markets. Currently, Couch works with a mining focused global private equity PE firm with several billion dollars of assets under management he is currently acting ceo of both lydian mining and armenian gold developer and alu for mining a guinean bauxite producer both portfolio companies of the pe firm mr couch also has worked with several financial firms in europe he was head of investment banking europe for bmo capital markets for a decade and also had senior investment banking roles with Credit Suisse europe and Citigroup solomon brothers mr couch, mr. couch has extensive public board experience on both Toronto Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange, and he holds both an undergraduate as well. We are pleased to have Jeff join the FNM board. Jeff has an impressive profile with significant public market experience in natural resources sector and deep capital markets routes. Having been based in London for over two decades, he is highly networked throughout Europe. In addition to the important strategic insights, he will provide his addition will substantially increase our exposure. As we continue our progression towards becoming a pr premier Nordic focused precious metals explorer developer. And also, the company is granted a million stock options exercise at 36 for a period of five years to certain directors and officers of the company. Uh, so, okay, I mean, this sounds like a pretty big gun. Uh, so, he's, he was head of investment banking for BMO Capital Markets. Uh, he works with a mining-focused global private equity PE firm with several billion dollars of assets under management. He's CEO of two companies, both portfolio companies of the PE firm. Okay, who, who can this mysterious PE firm be? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, wait. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, I know Lydian Mining, Orion, Mine, Finance. Uh, that's from 2000. Lydian Mining is a wholly owned subsidiary of L Lydian Canada Ventures, which in turn is owned by US investment company Orion Mine Finance. And actually, no, and I looked that up, they also have it with, I hope it shows up here, uh, gold, uh, Kansas or Cisco Gold Royalties. So, Lydian Mining is owned by 
Orion Mine Finance and Canada's Osisco Gold Royalties. So this guy uh, obviously works with slash for Orion Mine Finance because they are indeed a private equity firm with several billion dollars of assets under management. Orion Mine Finance, I would say, is probably considered some of the smartest money in the space. Uh, they have made some pretty good exits. I'm trying to remember the, the assets. I mean, I think they bought out the Deliradium project from Ross Beatty. I think it was Ross Beatty. It was. Well, he was the investor, I'm pretty sure. The Irish multi-million ounce gold uh, deposit. They also sold their stake recently of the... Uh, Green Rock, I think it's Green Rock, the Equinox new flagship Canadian gold mine. Orion was a, a partial owner of that, which they now have made a lot of money on since they sold it to Equinox. Uh, so, and he's again CEO of a multi million ounce gold developer and a bauxite producer. Does Orion and this guy know what makes a good mine? Yeah. So you have a big gun. And he works for... That's how I read. He, he, he probably works for Orion Mine Finance. Finance, the private equity with several billion dollars. And he got on board as a director on First Nordic. And you can see his resume. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I think... Uh, that guy probably knows a thing or two about, let's say, undervalued assets that could be, you know, flagship assets, let's say. That's a big gun. That's a big gun. I mean, if again, it's like if, if people can't see it, I, I don't know what to say. And there's even First Nordic has a new... Um, uh, 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 they have a new presentation up as well. They, ch I mean, they recently put up a new one, but they put up another one where they're again, it's like they can put out the PA, but they're hinting, it's like, okay, uh, re uh, resource grades rank well versus other bulk underground mines projects. Agnico owns a shit ton of bulk underground mines, and some of these are obviously very famous, or most of these. Kittele, La Ronde, Goldex, Malartig Underground, Detour Underground, Odyssey Underground, that's under, isn't Od Odyssey, I think that's another discovery underneath Malartig. Agnico are experts at, I would say, one of the experts at least, of gold uh, bulk mining underground. And here you have the grades. And this is refractory kittel at 2.93. And here you can see the grades of Yugi Bulk, Yugi Selective. 2.58, 2.64. Yep. Higher than most here except Kittele, which is refractory, and I guess La Ronde, which is polymetallic. Uh, okay, that suggests something. And the fact that Agnico Eagle is... <laughs> has the majority... Controlling share of the Borsle deposit, I think. And here, 2024 gold mine OPEX in northern Sweden. Björkdal, 1.6, long haul open stopping. And these are the, uh, the, the causes. And these are real life. This is like Q2. Last quarter 2024, these are de facto the statistics. Okay, 85 to 88% recovery. Uh, Barcel is expected to be higher, okay. And I think the stoves are, uh, well, the vein swarms, I think the zones are wider at Barcel as well. But let's, it just comes down to the most obvious, or the most obvious that sticks out is grade. I mean, up to like 2.7 instead of 1.6, and their Q, uh, Q2, they had an all in sustaining of 1553. So if you have more than 50% higher grade than Björkdal and would have even more economies of scale, hey, do you think Borsle, do you think the Borsle deposit would make a pretty great mine on par with some other of these bulk mining products? Yeah. 
literally, I mean, I was going to say this pretty much. Where, where is <laughs> this pretty much proves that. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and uh, Prismo Metals. Uh, Prismo is pleased to announce that drilling in Palos Verdes project in Mexico started. Whole PV2434, this collaborative drilling program with Visla Silver, has colored on Visla's property. The planned length of the first hole is 250 meters, out of a total expected 1,250 meters in the first phase of the program. Uh, now underway. Dr. Craig Gibson, co-founder and chief exploration officer of the company, the goal of the first phase of drilling is designed to explore the vein system to to the west of the fault below the zone of Bonanza Great Intercept from previous campaigns. We expect the first hole to cut both the Palos Verdes vein as well as high grade gold silver vein about 50 meters down deep from the previous intersections. As the report from last year's really include PV2325 with 102 grams per ton gold, obviously Bonanza, 3,000 3.1 kilograms of silver and 0.26% zinc or 0.5 meters or 11,520 grams per ton silver equivalent. The highest grade intercept recorded the project to date so yes it wouldn't be a long shot to think that this hole could hit some uh yeah bonanza grades getting to this stage is a result of joint efforts from both the prisma and visla teams in mexico said ellen lambert see prisma the planning and preparation effort included our team and our drillers team le le uh, learning visla safety work and environmental protocols before work could begin as the drill pads are located on their ground also, the type of drill permit obtained by Visla allows for sites to become accessed by man portable equipment. Furthermore, the rugged nature of the terrain required that access to the site and the site itself be done by hand. Uh, yeah, and they're excited to get this drilling, of course. I mean, Visla is, and, and I heard some people talk about a Visla at the conference. Yes, it's a, it's a, behem it's a behemoth, basically. Uh, probably the best silver discovery in quite some time. Prismo has ground kind of within their land package, within, you know, surrounded by Visla. So it's not, and I talked about this before, it's not like they or people should expect uh, this ground to become a standalone mine, if you know what I mean. But it obviously, if they found, I don't know, a couple, you know, tens of thousands of high-grade silver ounces, that could be worth quite a bit to Visla or whoever would buy Visla down the line. So, I mean, that's the natural buyer, obviously. Because if you if you put up a mill there, uh, if Visla puts up a mill there, which is most likely going to happen given the quality of it, quality of it, if they, you know, if there's a, some ounces here, that's going to get mined as well. Because the sun costs are already there. Uh, oh, yeah, and... Vior has finally started drilling. I, I touched on Dio, I think it was, uh, when was that, a m month ago, three weeks ago or something, when I said uh, Vio looks very interesting and there's a f they're free, free shares trading at uh, 12 cents or something. So I was looking to, you know, hopefully Vio would go down to like 12 or sub 12 cents. Again, th that's just part for the course or what what the expression is that's like okay they have 20 million in the bank the market cap was around 30 million or something uh, well, Cisco mining guys like the target they funded them together with a bunch of other people nothing has happened really except that the drilling was delayed but you also have people who are like okay I got in the 12 cents you know I'm uh if i sell above that maybe they get warrants or something so it's like okay you can see a reason why they would also uh why they would also uh sell sell that down in a sense if you know what i mean uh uh hu human nature i was gonna say and voila drill pyramids came and it showed up now of course we're uh, they're planned to be drilling sixty thousand meters i mean they can almost heck they could I mean, depending on how it goes, obviously. I mean, they can end up missing everything and finding nothing, but, you know, with some luck, 60,000 meters is like, uh, they could go way beyond the discovery in their first drill campaign, if you know what I mean. They make a discovery and actually prove it up in, in, in one uh, drill campaign. 
Uh, I think they're gonna use. I think they're using multiple rigs uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, very potentially very high octane story. Uh, by far one of the most aggressive gold explorers and. Uh, Especially given that they're testing a model, and I talked about this when I last covered Vior, where it's like, I think the CEO said something like, you know, they're expecting to maybe hit, you know, intercepts like 10 meters of like 15 grams per ton and stuff. I mean, if that starts to happen, yes, I think that this could rip quite well. With that said, uh, you're obviously up already if you bought uh, down here. Uh, there's again, like always, risk reward, uh, where it's like, the higher this goes before assays, I mean, the risk reward goes down. Uh, uh, so it's like, hey, depending on where it goes, uh, or the thing with this and uh, some other stores, like, down here, I think it was so cheap, there's like, hey, I would be happy to hold that, hold this into assay result, 60,000 meters. If I, if I can hold it, buy it at, let's say, 12... 11, 12, 13 cents, hold it into assays, great. I mean, if they end up making a significant discovery, that would be at, uh, down the line, would be trading at several hundred millions in market cap, obviously, if we're talking, again, a significant discovery. So at that price, I like the risk reward going into assays because I know what I paid for it, like, you know, let's say 30 million. But let's say it goes up to, I don't know. I'm not gonna. I mean, it might go down tomorrow or um, up to leading up to assets. I have no idea where this is gonna go. Still, my point is, let's say it comes to like now 40 million, 50, 60 million. I mean, then you can take some money off the table uh, because price has gone up without you know, and that doesn't mean it might go up to 60 million and then they come out with the assets and you know, six months from now. It's up to 120 million or something. That, that I'm not saying anything about that. But this is kind of again the risk wars. Like, okay, it's cheap, or like maybe it's cheap enough now. But but it was even cheaper down here. So it's like, okay, from that valuation, I'm okay with like if I held this through the campaign. If nothing happens, if they miss on everything, I'm gonna lose money. But from 30 million and drilling 60,000 meters, there's obviously some pretty high upside potential. Because they could almost infer a deposit uh, and a potential mine uh, before they are done with just this first drill campaign. So I would be happy, again, going either or. But then you also have the option, which turned out to happen right now, that people were actually or are excited about this drill program. So as soon as they started it, it ramped up. Then you have the options like, okay, should I take some money off the table without taking as a risk on that? I hope you get my point. It's like a bit of game theory. It's like, let's say there was no, I mean, there, there's also a possibility they never would have announced drilling, but I think that was low probability that would happen. But you have that kind of, you give yourself ways to win in a sense. It's so, let's say it's so cheap, it, it's okay to hold everything through assays. If it stays, to, stays at 12 cents up until the assays start coming out, let's say. But then you have the options like, okay, if people get a bit excited about the idea that, oh, I wonder what could happen if they drill 60,000 meters of drilling, given that, you know, Cisco guys like the project and they just sold Windfall, Windfall for like 1.6 billion and have made other billion dollar discoveries. Obviously, they should know something about Quebec geology and, and the gold potential at a certain target. So you know there's smart money betting on this having a potential to become a significant discovery, which might lead people to get excited and it's like, hey, you know, again, it's in six months, let's say a lot of the assets are out, perhaps, hey, this could be a major discovery. This could be one of the hottest stocks in the space. I'm not saying it's going to be. I'm saying there's a possibility. So you could either have some risk on risk holding cheap, going into assays and accepting the fact that, hey, if they don't make a discovery, I'm going to lose 50% of my money. Uh, but you also set yourself up to for the possibility that other people like the idea, which everybody, you know, most people do want to get rich quickly. And there's a possibility that this could go up a lot within the next, next six months. So when, when that got, uh, when that switched on, where it's like dead drill is in the ground, then all of a sudden the fuse is lit, people bid it up. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't have a huge position. Uh, I'm, now I'm kind of, I was going to say, 
neutral. Uh, I, I have no real problem of like uh, holding uh, most of my shares because um, I do think it's a very legit target and they're testing some region expiration plays and they're obviously some of the probably some of the best people in the space together with Osisco to actually make discoveries in the, this type of terrain for example. Uh, but I'm not against taking some profits either. You know, that, that's what I'm saying. So I don't want to, uh, like always, like I don't want to, it's very easy and I see that all the time, I, or I see it all the time. It's like, oh, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say that, hey, guys, this could be a, this could be a 10 to 20 bagger over the next two years. So better buy now, buy now, buy now. Or at least, uh, uh, I mean, you know what I mean. It's like, oh, please, everyone, bid it up so my position goes up because that's like the modus operandi. I'm not, I'm not perfect myself, but uh, uh, and but but now I'm just saying it's like, right now I have most of my shares I bought. It's not a huge position, but it's like I'm undecided if I am gonna ride my now a bit increased position, uh, or or you know should maybe take some profits. All profits, no profits, I haven't decided yet. And it depends on the, what the stock does. I mean, if, if this trades down to 14 cents or something, may, maybe I'll add actually. Because I'm, uh, oh, now I can, you know, at that price, I'm more inclined to take on more, you know, exploration risk. I'm saying I haven't decided. I'm not saying go out and buy this because you're going to get rich quick. But again, I, I want to give some example examples of how stuff, you know, that doesn't necessarily have too much to do with fundamentals but it's like okay uh, store uh, I think here might be start of drilling but let's say somebody you know found out that was coming boom I mean all of a sudden it's not like the project got any better or whatever but it just lit the fuse on you know the potential to quote get rich quick and that excites people apparently it, it uh, is enough even this crap environment this story is exciting enough for people to think uh, you know hey, i like that that idea if you know what i mean anyway yeah talked enough um uh talked your ear off probably uh thanks for listening again i'm i'm biased uh i think i own shares of what companies i mentioned i don't even remember what i talked about some are banner sponsors as well so uh twice biased uh because obviously if i'm long i you know I, I i want to be right or i want to think that it's gonna go you know gonna go higher um um but yeah so i mean yeah anyway i hope you get something out of it hit the like button comment if you want um thanks guys bye oh, and not investing advice bye bye